Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. The Hey Chaplain podcast is the place where members of the law enforcement community share their wisdom and experience through me, the chaplain, so that they can encourage others who wear the badge. Today, we're talking to a pair of forensic nurses. Their names are Morgan and Sarah, and they are forensic nurses in two different hospitals here in the Midwest. A forensic nurse is a nurse who has special training to examine victims of sexual assault and other violent crimes. It takes a tremendous amount of professional skill, empathy, and personal resiliency to do this day after day. And it also requires a wonderfully dark sense of humor, apparently. Make sure you catch how these nurses approach the victims of violent crime, the type of victim that they find the most difficult to face, and their relationship with local law enforcement, including a couple of really funny cop stories you won't want to miss. Please be warned, this episode contains limited clinical discussion of sexual assault and human anatomy. Listener discretion is advised. Here are the forensic nurses, Morgan and Sarah. Morgan and Sarah, how are you today? Good. Great. How are you? I'm <laughs> doing pretty well. I'm glad you're here today to talk about forensic nursing. Can you tell me what is a forensic nurse? So <laughs> it's such a hard definition. It's a pretty big umbrella. The type of forensic nursing that we do is within a hospital. So okay. we'll start, I guess we can start with that. So uh, we see patients inside the hospital who are, I like to say, victims of crime. So a lot of interpersonal violence. We mostly do sexual assault exams, but uh, we also see patients who have experienced domestic violence, human trafficking, elder and child abuse and neglect, and vulnerable adult abuse and neglect. So that's mostly what we do inside the hospital. Okay. We also can respond to traumas inside the hospital. So even people who maybe it wasn't like an intimate partner or you know, a domestic violence situation. So, you know, shootings, stabbings, that kind of stuff. We can respond to help collect evidence, take photographs, that kind of stuff too. So Sarah, is, the, is that primarily in the emergency department then? Yes. Okay. So is it is it likely that you would ever be called to another area of the hospital? Oh, yeah. I, I, just, I just did an exam today up on a floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So someone is already out of the emergency room. They've been admitted mm -hmm. or they're in somewhere else and, mm -hmm. and you get called up to that. So where are you? Are you stationed in the emergency room or? I actually, my office and our exam room is in the emergency room at the hospital that I work at. Um, but. What about you, Morgan? Same. Yeah. My, my office is in the emergency department. Yeah. Okay. okay. But a lot of times, most places that I've worked except for this place that I'm at now. Currently, there isn't actually a dedicated room. It's just whatever room the patient's in, and right. that's where you, you do your exams. Right. How long is a patient typically, like they come into the emergency room, how long before someone says, we need a forensic nurse? Is that something you're, like, before they get there, you're anticipating? Is it something that happens right away? Is it an hour or multiple hours later? <laughs> yes. Yes. All the above. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a great question I asked. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As you're asking that question, I kept thinking, ooh. It's really case-specific. So um, we could be notified. So we have a, a really good relationship with law enforcement that we work with. Okay. So the detectives may be sending somebody in and they'll give me a heads up and I'll be ready for them to come in. Or a patient will come in via EMS and they may not be able to consent at the time because our patients have to consent to the exam and participate during the whole exam because the consent process is ongoing and it's fluid. They get to say yes or no to every single piece of evidence collection that happens for us. As long as it's not a mandated report, um, you know, there's some intricacies that go into it, but um, it could be we may have to wait a little bit of time for them to be able to consent. And then they may be admitted uh, before they have the ability to consent. So we may have to go upstairs for that exam a little later. It really just depends on the patient and one, what they want and what they're able to and participate what they in. disclose initially when they first come in, because sometimes they'll come in and they'll say, I'm here because I have ankle pain. And then they get triaged, sent to the waiting room, Right. wait in the waiting room for however long, because we both work in very busy facilities. And then after that length of time, end up in the emergency room, room, and then they say, oh, I have ankle pain because I was escaping my captor, you know, three days ago, and I have a swollen ankle. And so 
it just depends on the disclosure. You know, sometimes we do know ahead of time, uh, especially my facility, we do pediatric patients. Um, a lot of times when the detectives are working with those patients, we know ahead of time that we have a patient coming in. Right. Um, so. So help me understand. What do you see as a forensic nurse that everybody else isn't seeing. Why do we need you to come do an exam? Because we're the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we do is we are very well versed and trained in both the law aspect of things and the evidence collection. So, yes, every ER nurse could do evidence collection if they knew how to do it properly and knew what to look for. Mm -hmm. We also are specifically trained, and we're trying to specifically train not only our law enforcement partners, but our the rest of our hospitals and all of our people who interact with these patients. We are trying to train them in trauma-informed care okay. and teach them probably the better way to talk to people and understand where people are at and meeting them where they're at. I've actually sat through Morgan's training in the police academy. I was there because I was going to teach later in the day, and I'm listening to her teach, and she's showing slides and, and the minute clues that you guys recognize that certainly I wouldn't recognize. And a lot of cops, until they're trained, they're not. They're going to look at a person, the person looks roughed up. Yeah. But they don't realize specifically, well, this is a clue. This this wasn't that they tripped and fell. This was somebody's hands on them. Uh, right. Or this was, you know, a lack of oxygen. Or this was some other thing that, that you recognize as medical professionals mm -hmm. that the rest of us aren't really spotting. We also have the ability to, with our patients, because we aren't law enforcement and we don't work for law enforcement, a lot of times they're more comfortable disclosing information to us. Sure. So especially if, you know, there's any illegal activities involved mm -hmm. prior to, after, during their assault, yeah. they don't want to disclose that to the police because they think they are going to get in trouble also. Okay. So Sarah, explain to me what is your role then as forensic nurse in the investigative process and the prosecution? I mean, it sure seems like you're, you're collecting evidence. You're not wearing a badge and a gun, but it sure seems like you're part of this process. So we do a medical legal exam, though, is what it's called. Okay. And so our exam is for medical purposes. Okay. So we are collecting evidence while we're doing our medical exam, but everything we do is medical based. So the history that I get from the patients is different than the investigative interview that the police are going to get because I don't need some of the nitty gritty details like the gray truck, the black truck. I don't need that <laughs> right. sort of stuff right. because that doesn't matter unless, you know, the person has black marks on them and they're like oh that was from the paint off of the truck or whatever right ours is so medical based that um we still do collect evidence but we also in the court of law have the medical exception to hearsay so anything hmm. that a, a victim tells us while we're doing our exam we can actually go to court without them okay and we can actually testify in their stead if need be, so say if they pass away between then and now, we can still go and testify for them based off of what they told us okay. during our medical exam. And you've been you've been called to testify in court. Uh, so I haven't actually testified in court, but been called many times. So in these situations, um, just to kind of add to what Sarah's saying, our process is not investigative. So we're actually not a part of the investigative process. Okay. We are kind of an extension to being able to collect that evidence. A lot of what we do is very invasive and um, private and has a lot of medical implications to it. And so instead of that person having to go through that process with law enforcement, we have the ability to treat them medically, but also collect evidence at the same time. Okay. So what we're doing is very medical based. It is not investigative at all. And we actually do a lot of education on preventing us from getting into that investigative process. Mm. So if we ask certain things or if something happens, we will talk about it being too investigative. Like that really? is not something that we need to look at or do because that's investigative. And then we're stepping out of our scope. Where does the handoff happen then? You're collecting evidence. There needs Correct. to be a chain of custody, all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So so how does that get handed off to the detectives um, 
where's that line at? So uh, during our process, we actually spend as much time with the patient as they need. So they control the entire um, period that they're with that forensic nurse. They get as many breaks as they need. They can, you know, take as long as they want. If they need to stop and go home, they can go home and then come back. We actually have five days to collect evidence in terms of a sexual assault. Then when we're finished, we actually have rooms. Um, they have to be behind two different locks. And so there's very specific stipulations oh, wow. that okay. we hold as nurses in terms of evidence. So that evidence is stored and chain of custody is held. And that is one of the most important aspects of evidence um, is the chain of custody. And that's what we teach too. So even if people are collecting evidence in the trauma bay who are not a forensic nurse, because that happens often, mm -hmm. we do education for them and help them understand that the chain of custody is very, very important. Right. And so we keep that. And then we work with, um, it depends on which jurisdiction it is, but if we're talking about our jurisdiction, we work with a CSI officer, um, okay. and I contact them and then they come and pick up. Usually it's a box full of evidence. Well, what's your relationship like with law enforcement? Like first name basis? Is it just like, well, here's a person with a badge? No, I mean, no it's, it's first name basis. <laughs> I would say that some of the officers have become very close friends to me. In yes. fact, I had a phone call very early in the morning from one of them. And when I went back and listened to the voicemail, because because in my work, I keep my phone on do not disturb. So those officers or people who need to get a hold of me know that they have to, you know, call, call me twice. twice in a row in right. order to get through it. It actually was his son who got a hold of <laughs> his phone and he, he was trying to call his Nana and he left me a voicemail. Oh. So, um, you know, having that ability and he's actually answered the phone when I called this detective before too. And so, right. um, I would call them my friends. I would call them if I needed something. So we have Absolutely. a really close relationship. Fantastic. And as I mentioned before, I've seen you do instruction sure. in the police academy. Yes. Have you both done that kind of oh, thing? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How does that happen? Does the department, um, do they have a requirement to teach that? Is that something that different That's departments want to do? Is how, how does that work? Yeah, most departments don't have a requirement necessarily to teach it, um, but they're already teaching it. So a lot of departments are finding out that they're teaching things that maybe necessarily aren't the most current, mm. maybe the best practice. Sure. And so they're reaching out to their programs, the people that they do know in the programs and saying, Hey, can you come teach it for us? You know, how, how you guys are doing sexual assault patients and, you know, trauma informed care and things like that. Um, and so I reached out when I started at my new job that I'm at currently, I reached out to our police department and said, I would love to come teach at your academy because oh, getting them at, yeah. at the very beginning yep. is a lot easier than trying to get into in-service later on. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And we also have SART teams that we're mm -hmm. a part of. So um, they're actually multidisciplinary teams where we get advocates together. What does together. SART stand for? Oh, <laughs> sexual assault response teams. Thank you. You beat me to the punch. Oh, <laughs> thank you. We have sexual assault response teams. Okay. And so we discuss those kinds of things on the SART team. They'll ask us to come and do um, education or we'll get together and we'll notice something. We'll say, hey, we need to address this. Do you want some education for your officers? Do you want me to put something together? for you. I've done some strangulation stuff at roll call, but we did get into the academy so that so we can lay that foundation. Description of strangulation. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. She, she, she didn't actually, actually strangle, strangle anybody officers. yet. Correct. Right. Okay. All right. Sometimes I want to. <laughs> There's a but it's really process. dangerous we can name some. don't strangle people. <laughs> <laughs> there are some. There's a couple. <laughs> well, you can't do that after you've taught them how to spot the signs. Right. Right. No, yeah. That, right. yeah. You've given away your game. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so... What does a shift look like for you? Oh. Are, do you have other responsibilities? You maybe go an entire shift without doing any of the forensic nursing element, or is it something that you, you get to work and you're immediately doing that kind of stuff? <laughs> So it depends on your team. Yes. So we are, we, so we're the program coordinators. So I could see of, a patient. Of your respective hospitals. Yes. yes. Okay. So we have a team underneath us who actually, um, we have a call calendar usually run by call and then they'll get called to come in and see a patient unless there's nobody on. Um, okay. usually then it falls to 
somebody who's in the hospital. Okay. So I could go see, you know, patients up on the floor in the pediatric unit on, on the units, or I could do exams in the department. Um, or I could have education that day, or I could be working on billing, or I could be working on some kind of presentation oh, wow. okay. here or there. So um, there's a it's a wide berth of what we do in our jobs, but we also have a team who will see patients kind of on a on call basis. And that's our the way we function. Mm-hmm. Some of the other hospitals have programs where their nurses are you know they'd go in for their twelve hour shift in the hospital. And they're on call, but they're in the hospital. And so they only do 36 hours a week of their shifts. But for that 12 hours, you're dedicated to whatever comes in the door. You are the you're the sane nurse. You're the forensic nurse. So it just is a wide variety out there. And I don't think one place has even remotely found the best algorithm yet sure and the goal is to have somebody full-time at your facility really Mm -hmm. a a call-based program is has been proven not to be the best option because um, forensic nursing and and sexual assault nursing specifically is short-lived and there's a high high turnover rates about a year so yeah well and that actually leads to my next question Uh, what you do is difficult very it's there's an emotional cost to it and so if you are looking at your week are you, is there a type of call? Is there a type of patient you're like that you dread? Is this like, man? I hope I don't have one of those this week. Is there is there any that's worse than another? Kids for me, all. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely kids for me. But we don't we don't really see or do a whole lot of sexual assault exams in at our facility because we have a children's facility close, so we okay. transfer those out. But in terms of abuse, well, we can see yeah. we can see that, and that's usually the hardest. For me, I think we have been doing this long enough that we've learned how to compartmentalize and then be able to process it later in a healthy way with with therapists or each other. We talk about, you know, especially on our podcast, we talk about us being our per- the person for each other. Yeah. Um, and if we do have a tough case and we need to just kind of process it right then and there, we can call each other. But that's it's mine's, mine's kids. <laughs> I think child abuse is probably Ch- yeah. the harder one. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. the only case in all 12 of my years that I've ever had nightmares from was a child abuse case. Yeah. And so that's probably the harder ones, but we are so kind of ingrained in this all the sure. time that, sure. you know, I, I don't, when somebody walks in the door, I will tell you, I don't like having to do exams on virgins, people who were virgins when they yeah. were sexually assaulted. Yeah. I don't like doing exams on them only because it's such a hard process to explain to somebody that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah. You know, and so that's really difficult, I think, on a mental level for me because I just feel almost I feel worse for them because this is your first experience yeah. and this is not the way it's supposed to go. Yeah. And so we have nice long conversations every single time that, you know, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. It will get better. I promise. Take and your trauma time though. that's yeah. associated with that and the process. So if not just that it was their very first experience, but maybe they've never had a pelvic exam before. So sure. are we associating you know, if, are we putting them in stirrups? How are you, you know, laying them to do the exam or how are you having them positioned to do the right. exam? Because they might avoid healthcare in the future correct. because exactly. of yes. the trauma. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So there's yeah. a lot to think about in terms of trauma informed care. And so we have to function on a different level and it's really difficult for emergency room, um, staff, not just nurses, but you're in a certain mindset when you work in an emergency department in in a busy place. And so to have to switch your mindset over to this really compassionate, empathetic care is very difficult because you're, you are, have, you have to harden yourself in order to deal with each patient that comes in and, and kind of, you know, the violence that we see against healthcare workers in the emergency department. So that's one of the biggest things I think that my staff has has reported is that it's very difficult to go from being um, a staff nurse as an emergency room nurse to having to take care of forensic patients. Also, yeah. the focusedness. I don't know that that's actually a word. It's fine. <laughs> uh, you ha- you have to focus on one patient and one thing, and it, that's a hard turn from an ER nurse that's 
you know, always juggling all, back and forth. Yeah, yeah, always doing something, always dealing with a different this and that. And then now for the next four to six hours, this is it. Yeah. You know, I, I sympathize with what you're saying about children and the abuse of children. Uh, as a police chaplain, if if I get called, it's probably because there's a dead body. Mm-hmm. And I've I try to approach this cl- clinically. And and honestly, a lot of dead bodies and being around dead bodies, standing next to a dead body for several hours doesn't really bother me anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. Except for when it's a baby. Yeah. Yeah. That that still bothers me. I think it bothers the officers. That's something that I feel like, okay, I need to follow up on. I need to go talk to somebody. I need to talk to the officers who were there, that kind of thing. Uh, the other one, the only thing that would even come close to that is doing a death notification to a family of a uh, deceased teenager. Mm-hmm. Teenagers in a car wreck, you go tell mom and dad right. that they're you know, why their baby didn't come home. Right. And, and so, there's so, so many different ways that people respond to yeah, so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and so a lot of other stuff, I can be very detached, but, but when it include when it involves children, that's, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. I've always said when a person comes in and they're doing chest compressions, they're coding them as they're coming in. That is so much easier for me to deal with hmm. than somebody that walks in the door, talks to me, and then dies in front of me. Yeah. It's yeah. so much harder because I, even in that split second, have, you know, gained, you know, this relationship with this person. So They were living yeah. first. Yeah. 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 Mercy. What is it most likely that the police will miss in regard to an assault victim? What are they most likely just to, they just didn't notice it, but you did? People who have been sexually assaulted are very unlikely to come forward with law enforcement. Okay. They're the experience of the sexual assault victim, patient, in whatever capacity you're seeing them. The experience is that they're at an uphill battle. And Mm. so I think our society labels sexual assault as um, you need to look for people lying first, as opposed to believing that they're telling you the truth first. And so... A lot of times police probably aren't even going to know unless they were called to the scene right away. So they're probably not going to be the first to know. They may even come to the hospital and it's us that they see first and then we call police in. And I think the, the biggest aspect of dealing with anybody who's been the victim of a crime that's an interpersonal crime is really to lead with compassion. And it's very difficult depending on what kind of law enforcement you work in. You know, we've had detectives or officers who deal a lot with crim- criminals. And so like you really have to, yes, mm-hmm. you have to change your mindset. You have to change the way that you're seeing this person that you're talking to because they've been through one of the most traumatic things that they have ever been through in their life. And there's no normal way to respond. Yeah. So they might miss the fact that this person is stoic and that could be perceived as they're lying. So right. there's, right. there's no normal response. That's the well, one thing that and, I want to say. And a, a dishonest person can still be victimized. Correct. So, exactly. So this cop may know right. this person. They've, they've run into them 10 times. Yes. But just because they've always been a liar doesn't mean that they're lying about this. Right. The other thing, too, which we've talked about and we teach also, is when it comes to trauma, the way that your brain lays down memories, we want it to be A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. But the way that your brain actually lays it down during a traumatic situation is is so all over the place that you may never even get to see. And if you do finally get to see it, maybe six months later. And so when they're, they're giving us their history and they're telling us what's going on, sometimes it can seem like they're lying because they're bouncing around, they're coming back, they're stumbling around their words. And so it does kind of seem like they can seem like they're lying. It's very disorganized, very disorganized. And when you do deal with those, those, victims who have been frequented by the police mm-hmm. um you know it's it's, it's difficult. difficult you know our psych patients our sex workers you know those addiction is a big one yeah, yeah. those are those are higher vulnerabilities for people so for them to come forward and say that they have been sexually assaulted or you know those things it's it's less likely that they're going to be believed because of the lifestyle that they live sure. but that actually makes them more vulnerable yeah yeah uh, so can you talk to me about power why would a victim not talk to a police officer 
I mean, is, is what kind of barriers are there as far as how this person has experienced powerful people in their lives? Mm-hmm. Can can you explain that to me and why? Because a cop wants to come in and fix everything, and and mm-hmm. and <laughs> well, why why are they not going to get a straight answer out of that? The victim? first thing they need to do is sit down. Yes. That's that's the first thing. Like, and you notice a lot of times they'll come and interview patients in the hospital, and they're walking up to the bedside of a patient, and they're standing there, hands their on their notebook, hips, yep, hands yep. on their hips, or yep. hands in their over notebook, the top. and they're over looking the top, down. looking down. Or if they're interviewing somebody, even you know, at a like you know, on a scene, and they're sitting down on the curb, and the police officer walks up to him. Eye level, you've got the taser, you've got the gun, you've got, you know, all of these kind of menacing properties. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is just sit down, get down to their level. And it's hard as an officer, I'm (laughs) sure, with all of that stuff. And our chairs in the hospital are not nice. Or take them to a more comfortable space. That's a little bit more private, too. I think there's a sense of power and control. Um, An officer has power and control on a scene, right? Like Mm -hmm. they're in charge. And so even in the hospital, we have this discussion too. The first thing that I do whenever I go to see any patient, any kind of forensic patient is I'll knock on the door and I'll ask for them to allow me into their space. Mm -hmm. And that's giving them a little bit of power and control back because now this is their space. And Mm -hmm. if they tell me no, I'll say, okay, I'll be back in 10 minutes. And I'll say, can I bring you anything or do anything for you? bring you a warm blanket. And I set a timer for 10 minutes and I come back in that 10 minutes showing them I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do and then I'm going to do what I told you I I was going to do. And then I will take a stool and I will roll it up to the bottom of the bed and I will sit at the bottom of the bed and just ask them what they understand. I'll ask them, you know, what um, they know that I do or if they understand what's happening. Um, Because there is a certain level of power and control because that officer has control of that scene. So it's always important to understand. And when you sit down, somebody perceives that you've sat there longer. Mm -hmm. It's actually um, seven minutes longer than you would any other. Even if you stood there, it would be a normal, the same amount of time they think you've been there seven minutes longer Hmm. and taken that time. And if you think about, too, you know, a good portion of our patients probably have not had very good interactions with law enforcement prior to also. Right. Because we do have, you know, quite a large population of even, even like our trafficking patients, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them have probably come into contact with law enforcement previously and haven't had a good experience because they were doing something illegal, (laughs) right? Not because the officer was just like, they're walking down the street and the officer's yelling at them, but, you know, they were doing something illegal. They've had a bad experience with police officers because they've been in trouble before. And, but now they're the victim and it's hard for people to even separate that in their minds, you know, because the officer's there and I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I just casually observe this. I, I'm a tall, middle-aged male. Mm-hmm. And and I see people that as a counselor, I a little red flag goes up because because of how they respond to me. Mm-hmm. They, they respond to me as if I'm menacing. And mm-hmm. I feel like I'm being pretty meek and mild. But I can't change that I'm a male. I can't change that I'm tall. Right. Uh, maybe inadvertently even I'm kind of looming over them. And, and you can see people much like a... I hate to compare them to an animal, but you see that in a dog. Absolutely. If you, if you hit a dog enough, if you stand yeah. over a dog, it'll cower. Absolutely. Or move your hand too fast yeah. or right. anything right. like that. Yeah, it's right. the startle response. Right. And so you see the same thing in some people. And and I know that officers are not meaning to trigger that. Absolutely not. But, nope. but they do. Right. And and there's little things they can learn. It's like, hey, I need to switch gears mm-hmm. here. Right. So. And I think our society, too, kind of sets a precedent for what police officers are there for. And and. Recently, they haven't got the the best rap. And so it's important to remember those little things really will help make a better connection with that person that you're trying to talk to. It's very difficult to talk to somebody if we're talking about sexual assault, to tell somebody you don't know, especially a male officer, if you're a female, that somebody has just violated you really intimately. And so um, remembering those, those things too, as much as you want a linear story, it's probably going to be disorganized and it's going to sound like they're not being truthful, but that's just how our brains work when we experience trauma. Okay. One of the things I almost always say at the academy is, you know, you'll have the officer sitting around. A lot of times you can see their names and I'm like, Officer Smith, I want you to tell me 
your last sexual experience <laughs> in detail. And then you just sit there with a straight face ready to hear what they're going to say. And most times they turn really red. Oh, yeah. And they look around like, oh, my, do I, am I supposed to do this? Yeah. And then they start shifting in their, their chair. Eyes get big. Their eyes get big. <laughs> they're like, do I? Yeah. And then everybody around them is also like, oh, my oh, gosh, please, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to do? listen to this. I don't want to yeah. know. <laughs> and then I say, that feeling you're having right now, imagine you've just been sexually assaulted and I ask you that question. Yeah. It's yeah. very difficult to be like, okay, all right. You know, and I think that yeah. that gets them every time. And they're like, that it triggers something in them to say, yeah. oh, yeah, no, I wouldn't want to do this on a normal basis. Yeah. They couldn't generate a clear, concise, no. consistent story. I'll and tell you so, who why could, in the world it could it activate your fight or flight right. response yeah. for sure? I'll tell you who does, though the fire department. Don't ever ask that question <laughs> at the fire department. <laughs> They'll be real boys, honest. Those they boys are care. like, well, let me just tell you. <laughs> like, wait, pause. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Pause. That, was just, that was supposed to be a test. <laughs> this is just an exercise. Testing, <laughs> testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so what could cops improve upon? I mean, if you could kind of ride in the back seat and and be, you know, the fly in a wall and and be there through the entire process long before the the victim ever gets to the hospital, what would you have cops do differently, or what would you encourage them to do more of? Trauma informed. Mm -hmm. I think that the that the education about being trauma informed and understanding why somebody who's experienced a traumatic thing reacts the way that they do because there's no normal reaction, right? If we're talking about the fight or flight response, your brain does what it wants to do in order to help you survive, and unless you have um, experienced an enumerate amount of trauma in your life and built a habit of responding to trauma, your brain's going to do what it thinks it needs to do uh, in order to protect you. And that and, may not fit the stereotype correct. that the officer's expecting. More than likely, it's not going to fit that stereotype. Um, I never have a patient respond the same way ever. And it's really, really important to remember that you're going to have to be a little bit more compassionate and empathetic with these types of, and I'll use the word victim, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're talking about law enforcement. For us, they're patients. They're not right. victims. Um, but this type of victim is has a very different response. And that's why you're seeing that is because of their fight or flight response. And I do really think that getting down to their level or below them is really like that's handing back something to them okay. immediately. And so I think that that's huge. Yeah, that's going to be good for the victim slash patient, and it's going to be good for the investigation. Right. And so absolutely. yeah, they'll probably build a get, rapport with that person. Right, and get a whole lot more out of them because now they trust that you're not just looming over them mm -hmm. to... Judging. Ju judging. Mm. Yeah. 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 So you are around a lot of police officers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good cop stories <laughs> that you can tell on air? Yeah. Know, I do have to say that um, my experience with our officers has been mostly good. If I ever have an issue, I, I know I can always reach out. But, you know, I think we have a ton of stories that we, we could talk about. We can't say names. No, I had one where we had a very frequent, and I wonder if he listens to this too. I'm going to be interested to find out later. But uh, we had a very frequent sex worker come in. And I had done quite a few exams on her. And this detective came into the room. There was a curtain in between the door and the patient's room okay. where he could stand in the room behind the curtain and not see anything and still talk to the patient. Knowing the patient, he definitely did this and was talking to her while I was doing my exam. And I went to go do my pelvic exam, and apparently the odor was a little bit too much for him. And he vomited in the trash can. <laughs> and it probably was like, I didn't even realize for you. I had no clue that there was that much. I mean, I knew that it was like odiferous for sure. But you've but been I, desensitized to it to a degree. You can yeah, handle it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I had Unless no, it's snot. Sarah doesn't do okay, snot. Nope. 
Nope. Anything resembling snot? Uh-uh. Nope. <laughs> nope. Don't do it. <laughs> that's, that's your line? That's my line. <laughs> snot is her line. Snot is you, my... got, you got detectives vomiting in the corner, but no snot, I'm please. Like, oh. I'm yeah. like doing a pelvic exam and helping like wipe a face off at the same time. <laughs> I can't. Like if you sneeze on me, I will die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She will. She will, definitely. That's awesome. That's awesome. What about you, Morgan? I think it was when I was teaching the ins and outs of sexual assault to our detectives. Uh, I had the opportunity... <laughs> to bring a pelvis in and of course I was kind of showing the the process I It's like a teaching mannequin kind yes. of thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And no, I she brought somebody's actual well, pelvis in. <laughs> well there's a good story for that too where I find my pelvises. But um, um oh that's a great story actually. <laughs> but I was using the word penis and vagina a lot because that's what we do. And one of them goes, Can you please stop saying vagina? And I was like are you uncomfortable with the word vagina? And I was like, no, I'm not going to stop saying it because this is what we do. You have to get comfortable with saying those uncomfortable words. And I, I just was, I was, I would love to know what he wanted it <laughs> yes, to be called. I can't, all of the options going through my head are worse. Right. Yeah. So I can't <laughs> yeah. imagine. We, so I warned them, you know, I'm going to say penis and vagina a lot. And the other day, <laughs> The other day, my son was like, Mom, I have to watch the puberty video. And I said, I think I said something about penis. And he was like, don't stop it. And I was like, what well, was called? Why are we? Right. Right. That's the we're going to word. use those yeah. words. I that's don't what, know what he wanted what me God to say. I know. I'm not really sure what he wanted me to say, but that was not it in that moment. He was real uncomfortable. So. Same said detective that vomited also requested that I come in and do an anatomy lesson for the detectives. And it was all males and one female. Okay. And I got to show a really great video about the hymen and how the hymen actually never goes away. It's always there. And just the looks on their faces, the redness. <laughs> I mean, just saying the word hymen in front of police officers sometimes is Maybe the that's best. why they didn't want the vagina word. He's like, can you just stop saying that? <laughs> right? <laughs> sorry. Ooh, sorry. A little uncomfortable. <laughs> the counselor in me is is just... I'm um, interesting. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Again, what else would you like me to use? I went into a a roll call. It was a late night roll call one time, and I they asked you know chaplain, do you have anything to to offer? And typically, I don't. I just I'm just there to observe and and uh, you know build relationships with those guys. But but I said, yeah, I've got a dead guy's foot in my trunk, and and they all like. You know the whole room just like like record scratch. Stop! You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> we, the other chaplain had had done a funeral of an of a person who had a prosthetic leg, and and oh the family, gosh. of That's course, funny. of course, the family said, "Well, now that he's passed, we'd like you to have his foot." What, like, what is the chaplain who officiates the funeral going to do with this foot? Right. You know, maybe, maybe they thought they were going to donate it, Wait. but prosthetics, the, the hardware of a prosthetic can be can be recycled, mm -hmm. can be refurbished maybe, but a lot of the the part that gets sweaty and gross <laughs> is, is a lost cause, right? Not only is it sweaty and, and gross, but it's also it's made, made for, for the yes, person. Yes, yeah. yes. And so he, he didn't know where to, he tried to take it one place, they wouldn't accept it, so he put it in the trunk of the chaplain's car in August. <gasps> and so no. I'm driving like a month later, I'm driving the car and I'm like, why does this car smell? What is this thing? And so I open it up. There's a leg and there's a flesh colored leg. I mean, it had a, like a, a metal ankle, right. but, but the flesh colored leg in the trunk You're of like, the chaplain's <laughs> car. Like what in the world? And so I asked him and I got the whole story. I'm like, oh, I understand. I could, the words there's I nowhere I could put it either. <laughs> no, no, but not I at all. But I couldn't take the smell anymore. And so I asked him, I, I, I said, I don't want to throw this away, but I don't want to be seen on the security footage. Throwing a leg <laughs> into the dumpster. <laughs> and so I want you guys to come with me right. and we're going to glove up and, and we're going to take this thing away. and we're going to put it, <laughs> we're going to dispose of it. Oh and my so goodness. That's, that's, that's the, hilarious. The dead guy's foot yeah. in the chaplain's car. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. That's incredible. That's the best. That's incredible. <laughs> well, yeah. tell me about your podcast. Oh, Speaking goodness. of funny stories, uh, you, you <laughs> produce a podcast. Tell me about it. I have to tell you that when I told Sarah we were going to be doing this, I said, yeah, the chaplain asked me to do the podcast with him. And I was like, I recommended ours. And she goes, Morgan, you recommended our podcast to a chaplain? I said, you told a man of God to listen to our podcast? 
Are you kidding me? Now, a- admittedly, I listened to about three episodes and I stopped what I was doing and Googled how to bleep out <laughs> foul language. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've done pretty good. Though. No, you've done, done great amazing. today. You've done really well. Yeah. Done really well. But we just but, decided yeah. because we've been forensic nurses so long. Um, we decided we wanted to start a podcast that kind of talked about things that we've learned over the years about forensic nursing, but because forensic nursing is not something fun to talk about, um, we keep it very light. Uh, we are potty mouths. Yeah. <laughs> potty mouths. Mm-hmm. I mean, my grandma listened to, I think the first two episodes and was like, I can't do this, can't do this anymore. anymore. Yeah. yeah. Everybody thinks that cops have bad mouths. Oh. They, they do, but nurses, nurses, nurses are way worse. And I a know. veteran nurse, <laughs> a, a veteran nurse and a nurse married to a firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. yeah. No. We also do. We also cover, um, really tough subjects too, like talking to your kids about sex, uh, what that looks like. We did, we did a really fun one, which is one of our favorites, which is probably the most that needs to be censored, but it was <laughs> questions that you don't want to ask your doctor. So like embarrassing questions, mm-hmm. but we add humor into those really, really tough subjects. And we use those lighter, <clears throat> lighter subjects as a way for us to be able to kind of continue to do it. So we talk about domestic violence. We talk about human trafficking. I like that you talked about some of these topics in relation to stuff that was in the news, like with celebrities. Right. Yeah. We're, we just we, did, we did the Kanye and Kim thing mm-hmm. and, right. and we're going to talk about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp as soon as that t- trial ends. Which, yeah. oh man, I was watching her testimony today. Yeah, Are they it's cross-examining it? right now they okay. started today and yeah. it's very interesting to watch her. And I've seen a lot of coverage from some police officers, too, on um, how they look for dishonesty in, in, in investigations when they're doing interviews. And so um, he talked a lot about her mannerisms and things like that. Um, but this is definitely an interesting one because, you know, the victim in this situation is is a male and yeah. the perpetrator is a female. And, you know, we talk a lot about believing victims. And that's one of the huge misconceptions is that men can't be, you know, victims of yeah. domestic violence. Yeah. And they and don't come forward as no. much because it's, you know. Well, they'd be ridiculed. Right. They, yes. May not get any help. Yeah. yeah absolutely. They're not masculine. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. not manning up. Yeah. And, we, we can talk about it off air, but I'd love to hear your take on the Will Smith Jada Pinkett Smith uh, yeah. dynamic. That, oh, that, that would be a good one for us to cover. Does not sound yeah. healthy. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll tune in. I'll tune in. So right. the, the podcast is called. Do I make you uncomfortable? Okay. And I presume it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere. Yeah, you, you can, can find it wherever you listen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And we just started doing what we call small episodes too, just kind of mm-hmm. intermittent small episodes, just to kind of really kick in that lightness. And uh, I did one where I read uh, restaurant reviews to Morgan and she had to guess the restaurant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we did one. That was uh, this last state one laws. was dumb state laws. Dumb yes, state yeah, laws, yeah. where she had to guess the state. Yeah, I did pretty good yeah. actually. Not on no, the geography. She didn't, Not no, on the geography. She, she, didn't guess, <laughs> she guessed two states out of the twenty no, that I, I did gave it. her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's a it's a good show. It it is definitely not for children. Uh, no, um, but but for adults to maybe take some of the stigma and the sting out of some of these difficult topics. Yeah. Let's right. talk to talk to two nurses who understand this and and have a lot of compassion with a lot of humor. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was a good job that you guys yeah. did. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us. This yeah. is wonderful. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so thankful to both Morgan and Sarah for telling me about such a difficult job, one that I barely knew existed before meeting them. And did you catch how high they said the turnover was? One year? I'll be praying that hospitals can figure out how to retain good nurses for this work and pay them well. I know that cops really appreciate the work that these two do, and I respect the fortitude that it takes to do the job and do it well. God bless you both. If you want to hear more of Morgan and Sarah, listen to their podcast, Do I Make You Uncomfortable? I'll put a link to it in the show notes. On the next episode of Hey Chaplain. This is unnatural for most people. Most people, they get told their whole lives in kindergarten all the way up through their, (laughs) you know, when they're adults, keep your hands to yourself. We've all heard it a thousand times. And just because someone gets a job as a police officer and they go into the academy, 
that rule still applies. <laughs> right. 21 years of their life, they've been told to keep your hands to yourself. And now we're telling you, hey, put your hands on a total stranger. Right. Uh, this is who a, doesn't yeah, want it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> who's telling you, no, don't, I don't want to do what you say. Yeah. And not to mention that person's, you know, uh, aggressive. They're fighting. You know, it could it could escalate beyond that. So teaching officers to physically put their hands on someone else is a is a hard subject to teach, hmm. but it's a necessary one. The views expressed here are the personal views of the host and our guest and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. None of the preceding conversations should be construed as medical advice, and if you have medical questions, please consult your doctor. If you liked what you heard here, please share this episode with a cop or a nurse or someone who loves a cop or a nurse. Thank you for listening today, and as always, pray for peace in our city.